For those who are here, you may remember all the way back to February the 28th, we began a series called Shape to Serve. And it's an acronym, and this is the final exam today, right now. You're all taking it, okay? What is the S? Feel free to shout it out. What is the S in shape? Spiritual gifts. All right. What is the H referred to? Heart or passion, right? Our heart. What's our heart? But what's the A? Abilities. Abilities. What is the P? P. Was anyone here in March? <laughs> personality. Personality. And E? experiences and so when you put those all together that's how God has shaped us to serve okay so if you're if you're wondering because you maybe missed that teaching if you were to look back on the Belmont Village Church website you will find those messages uh, throughout the month of March when we talked about spiritual gifts in fact it was week one when we introduced the series I, I shared seven principles about the use of spiritual gifts Number four is extremely relevant for our conversation today, and it is this. Spiritual gifts are for building others up. That's the whole point. When you see the word edifice, edifice, this is not working very much. Get a little louder, maybe. Um, when you see the word edifice, you think of building, right? Well, when you see the word edify in the Bible, think building. Okay, in fact, it's often translated build up, but it's the same word as edify. So in 1 Corinthians 14, you have it five times referring to spiritual gifts that they're about building. For strengthening, encouraging, and comfort, we use our spiritual gifts. Verse 4, the one who prophesies edifies the church. Verse 5, so the church may be edified. Verse 12, try to excel in those gifts that build up the church. Same word. 26, everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Here's the point, though. Edification requires intelligibility. Edification requires intelligibility. If you don't understand what is being said or done, you don't feel built up. And I thought, what's a simple, simple example? When you see a child, so many here have children, nieces or nephews or grandchildren, when they're around somewhere between one and one and a half years old, they finally take a spoon and feed themselves, right? And that's so exciting. Like, it's so exciting because it means one last thing that mom or dad has to do, right? Now, if you were to turn to the kid and say, your motor control and spatial awareness is superlative, <laughs> they're just going to look at you and maybe throw something at you, right? Because they don't understand. You tried to build them up and edify them, but it was not intelligible to them. Well, it's the same with God. He wants to build up the church, and he wants to do it in such a way that we're intelligent to how he's building us up. And what's so fascinating is that tongues is one of those things that he chooses to build us up and we don't have a clue what's happening unless we do because it gets interpreted or it gets ex explained okay so that is where we're going because you remember the dallas willard quote i love it so much where he says that every discipleship practice that you have as a follower of jesus it should pour into the funnel of your life and out should drop one thing sacrificial love and so if you know Jesus, you've been saved and gifted so that you can build up others. That is the intent of it all. So what is a spiritual gift? This is, again, way back in March, so I'm just going to share this again. Sam Storms, in his book, Understanding Spiritual Gifts, has a great definition. A spiritual gift is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit's presence. That's what Scripture says. And power into and through individual believers to enable them to exceed the limitations of their finite humanity so that they might faithfully and effectively 
um, fulfill certain ministry tasks for the building up of the body of Christ. Of the 20 spiritual gifts listed in the New Testament, they fit nicely into four categories, and I'm not going to test you or quiz you on that one, okay? They're all, they all begin with S. One is the support gifts. Uh, secondly, the supernatural. They're all supernatural, but these ones especially because they're revelatory. They're, there's no earthly way that just by human ability we could do them. Uh, and then there's serving gifts and speaking gifts. Well, here are the ones on the screen that we have looked at so far. And we, we went in depth with each of these, okay? So we've looked at all the support gifts for the church, apostles, prophets, and pastors. And we've begun looking at supernatural revelatory gifts starting on the top left. We've looked at prophecy, miracles, healings, and faith. What's next? Where are we going? Well, here's where we're going. At the very least... It's a strange gift. At the very most, it's a frightening gift. It's a frightening gift. I'll explain why. Now, can we take a moment, though, to acknowledge what I call weirdness in God's word? <laughs> there is weirdness in God's word, and we need to acknowledge that. I'll give you a couple of examples. In the Old Testament, there's a prophet named Elijah, and they need to build a, a new place for the prophets because there's so many of them that when they get together. So everyone goes out and says, eh, we'll all cut down a pole. We'll, we'll put together a log cabin. And one guy is, is wailing away on a tree, and his ax head flows off, flies off and, and goes into a stream or a river. And he, he cries out. He says, no, it was borrowed. <laughs> and Elijah hears it. And so he cuts a stick, says, where exactly did it go in? Throws the stick where the iron uh, head of an ax went, and the ax head floats to the surface. Really? Really. That's God's story, and he's sticking to it. Um, a little later in 2 Kings, uh, a fellow is being buried. So the Israelites are burying some guy. They're having a funeral when Moabite raiders come, and it says that they take the dead fella's body and they don't place it in a tomb. It says they threw it into a tomb. It happened to be the tomb where Elisha's bones were, where he had been buried. And the guy's body touched Elisha's bones, and the guy came back to life. Really? In the New Testament, Peter's shadow, as he walks down the street, passes over people and they are healed and they get up from their mats and they start walking. Handkerchiefs and aprons that touch Paul then touch people and they are healed. Oh, we're just getting started. Then there's Jesus, okay? Seriously, what would you have said or done if you had been in the crowd in John 9 when Jesus all of a sudden starts spitting on the ground and it says he's making mud? Have you ever tried to make mud with spit? It takes a lot of spit. <laughs> I had a thought to illustrate it here this morning, but I thought that'll clear the church out if we talk about strange, right? It takes a lot. But then what did he do with it? Like, put yourself there, okay? Uh, a seeing impaired man is in front of Jesus. He makes this mud from the spit and the dirt, and then he puts it on the guy's eyes. He starts rubbing it into the guy's eyes. And then he says, go to the pool of Siloam and wash, <laughs> which is kind of humorous. Find your way, your way there, blind fellow. Uh, not going to help you. You just got to find your way to the pool of Siloam. Wash that off, and you will see. And he did. Or how about Mark 8, verse 23, when Jesus spits directly into a guy's eyes. I got thinking about that one. It would take a number of tries for me to spit in someone's eye. So 
If we have four people to volunteer, I think I could get one in four. <laughs> could we have four? Oh, I knew, I knew. I... It's definitely a youth group event. <laughs> He's right. He then, uh, he spits in the guy's eyes. He then puts his hands on him, his eyes twice. Why twice? Because the first time he says, so how, how's your sight now? And he says, well, I see people walking like trees. Oh, okay, I'll touch you again. Touches him again. And now he can see perfectly. What? <laughs> this, this is in God's word. This is Jesus. Or how about the strangest spitting healing of them all? In Mark chapter 7. This is so strange, I have to read it word for word. Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. And then he spit, and he touched the man's tongue. So presumably, hand and finger and tongue, finger and ears, I think what he's doing is kind of getting a circuit flowing, right? Maybe? I, I have no idea what's happening. Verse 34, he looked up to heaven, and with a deep sigh, he said to him, Afafta. It's Aramaic, and it means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, and his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Wow. God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, did some weird stuff in God's word. And so here's the question. Why would we think that God wouldn't do some weird stuff today. Tongues. Tongues. We somehow need to get past the weirdness factor. It's a fear, right? It's a fear. We, we don't want things to get bizarre. Physi physical healing. Can we turn this off, please? Physical healing through prayer, through a word, through, through a touch, we're okay with that. But, but what if someone, just think about this for a moment, what if someone with a withered arm and a withered hand were to walk in here and someone were to come up and touch them and pray over them and we physically saw that arm grow out and the hand grow out to a normal hand, we would say, wow, that was God. And we'd also probably say, and I'm out of here. That's just too strange for me, right? It's just too weird. But, but I, I, again, I say, ha, have I read the Bible lately or ever? <laughs> because there's so much weirdness in God's word. And here's the beautiful thing. God knows how we're wired because he's the one who wired us. And look what it says. This is the Spirit of God speaking through Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, 23. So if the whole church comes together just like this, and everyone speaks in tongues, whatever they are, we'll look at those, and inquirers or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is yes. They will say you're out of your mind. God highlights the weirdness. Like especially for unbelievers who have not maybe encountered the power of God. There's just a great weirdness. They'll say, you're out of your mind. Ruth just read in Acts 2, what did they say? You Christians, been into the wine, right? So you're either out of your mind or been into the wine. Nice rhythm to that, but either way, it's not a positive thing. And here's the thing. God's okay with all of it. God is okay with all of it. He loves you and he loves me so much that he wants our attention. He wants our attention. The issue with tongues, I gotta be honest, the issue with tongues, the weirdness piece, is the people factor. It's the people factor. Here's one example, if you look on the screen. In the Assemblies of God denomination, okay? Very popular in the US especially, you cannot be a pastor or a missionary if you don't speak in tongues. In many Baptist denominations, you cannot be a pastor or missionary if you do speak in tongues. <laughs> so here's what's happening. All the, <laughs> all, the, 
All the assemblies of God, pastors and missionaries, who never spoke in tongues, have to join the Baptists. And all the Baptists, pastors and missionaries who do speak in tongues, have to join the assemblies of God. That's wacky, right? And the other issue, of course, is what happens in some circles, what, what I call charismatic chaos, where there is an abuse of many of the spiritual gifts, but especially tongues, where, where you'd come into a, a room like this and everyone's speaking in tongues at the same time. And scripture expressly forbids that without an interpretation and one by one, but, but that happens. And so all these degrees of weirdness that happen make it such a strange phenomenon. Now, I'll say what I said in, earlier in this series. I, I think this just matters a lot. The best argument for cessationism, which means the gifts have ceased, these supernatural gifts have ceased, the best argument for that is the really bad practice of some continuationists. So the people who believe the gifts have continued, but they're abusing them. Sadly, these are what are called ad hominem arguments. In other words, they don't come from bad doctrine, they come from bad character. They're ad hominem arguments. They're not good arguments at all. And I don't mind naming names. You're saying, like, are any of these people high profile, abusing the spiritual gifts? Yes, Kenneth Copeland, Paula White, Sid Roth, Benny Hinn, just to name a few. They're abusing the gifts. Having said that, I really believe that our Lord Jesus, he says, my church is a holy mess, but she's the mess that I love. And he just keeps relentlessly loving his church. But I have said all of that. I have said all of that to say this. I really care about our hearts and our hearts toward God. What is your posture toward God and the things of God. What, what's it going to be? If you look on the screen, is it open but cautious? In other words, healings, yes. Prophecies, okay. Tongues, no, it's just weird. What will people think? It could be fake, it could be gibberish. I've got every excuse in the book to not believe it. Here's bet, in fact, maybe you're open but nauseous of the idea of some of these gifts, right? But, but here's the best posture. Eager and wise. Eager and wise. Because scripture tells us to be eager. 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. So eager and wise. Why? Because their spiritual gifts are a manifestation of God and they are to build people up. Why wouldn't we want those? Well, let's talk about tongues. I mean, it just seems appropriate to talk about tongues, right? And so here, oh, Karen understood what, what I did there. Okay, here are the main passages that speak about tongues, and we will look at these. But, you know, I had a thought. Some of you are saying, what are tongues? Like, we all have a tongue. Is it talking about our tongue? Well, sort of, but not quite. Here's a simple working definition that may get more nuanced as we dig into the topic, okay? The gift of tongues is the Spirit's presence and ability to allow a child of God to speak or pray in an unlearned language that builds oneself up through communing with God or builds others up through interpretation. Oh, the questions right? I mean, just seeing that definition gives a little bit of clarity, but I'm sure there's lots of questions. And one of those questions is, what, what is the purpose of tongues? And we are going to look at that in this message. But, but before we do that, let's ask the number one question on the subject of tongues, okay? And the question, the number one question is not, are tongues for today? That's not the number one question. I don't mind addressing that one really quickly. I think I said this earlier, maybe back in March, that if, if someone were to read their Bible for 10 years, and especially in the New Testament, nowhere are you going to read where God has rescinded this call to eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy, and to speak in tongues. He, he doesn't say stop doing that. 
And so they are for today, but used properly. Uh, the other big question, but not the number one question, are tongues the evidence or an evidence of being filled with God's spirit? And the answer is simple. When you read God's word, no. Being filled with God's spirit happens the moment you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, but then there's that continual filling of the spirit as we allow him to move into our lives and sanctify us and set us apart more and more. But that is not related to speaking in tongues because Paul even asked the question, do all speak in tongues? And the answer is no. So people can be filled with the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues. The number one question, here it is on the, on the screen. Are tongues known human languages or unknown non-earthly languages? And you say, Gord, are you going to go out in a limb and tell us what you believe? I want to, but I know you will saw off that limb if I do. <laughs> but, I, but I will. I will. Okay. And somewhere, somewhere on some particular date in history that we don't know, a theologian put some sweat equity into the following terms. Okay, here's the two terms, xenolalia, or sometimes it's, it's called xenoglossia, and glossolalia. I, I saw some eyebrows raised, like you're speaking in tongues right now. Okay, xeno, xenos, means foreign. Lalia simply means speaking. If you take the bracketed word, xeno is foreign, glossia is tongue, literally the translation of the word tongue or language. So it means foreign language or foreign tongue, okay? Glossolalia actually comes from a Greek phrase, <clears throat> glossaeus lalian, and it literally means tongue speaking. You say, I don't see the difference, right? <laughs> Here's the difference. Xenolalia means speaking a known language. Glossolalia means speaking an unknown language. So from here on, when you hear me say xenolalia, we're talking about someone who doesn't know German, all of a sudden they can speak German, okay? It's a known language, as an example. Glossolalia is an unknown, unearthly language. So that's the question to ask every time we see the word tongue or tongues in our English Bibles. Fair enough? That's the question. Which is this? The context will always decide. Well, we read from Acts 2. And we're just going to quickly go through this, okay? And I'm keeping my eye on the clock. When the day of Pentecost came, so Pentecost, Pentecostal. We, we've heard that term, right? Penta means five. Pentecost refers to 50 days after Passover. Okay, so that's what it means. It, it's a feast of the Jews. Passover is a big feast. Pentecost, 50 days later, is a big feast. Um, could go into all the, you know, the background, but... We won't. 50 days. Well, you may recall that Jesus was crucified over Passover weekend, was buried and resurrected over Passover weekend. But he then was on the earth for 40 days, and so there's a full 10 days between the ascension of Jesus and this moment in Pentecost. What was the church doing for those 10 days? Well, they were waiting. They were waiting for the promised Holy Spirit. So they were all together in one place. Notice verse 2. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now you talk about weirdness in God's word. Look at verse 3. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, glossa of fire, that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Heteros glossa, another of a different kind of tongue. Xenolalia or glossolalia. Keep reading. Context will tell us. Verse 5. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound... Commentators are a little bit divided on what they heard. Was it the sound of the mighty rushing wind? Was it the sound of the tongue speaking? Could have been both, right? 
When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken, not the word glossa. Listen to this Greek word and see if you can translate it into English. Dialectos. Dialect. Everyone heard their own dialect being spoken, their speech, their language. Verse 8. Seven. Utterly amazed, they asked, wait a minute, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Like they'd be speaking Hebrew. Then how is it that each one of us hears them in our own language, dialectos? Okay? Now, there is a scholar named uh, J. Rodman Williams, not Robin Williams, Rod Man, Rodman Williams, J. Rod, Rodman Williams. And this is what he says. He says, the miracle of tongues in Acts 2 is not the miracle of speaking, but the miracle of hearing. Huh. That almost seems plausible, doesn't it? They're all hearing in their own language. So the miracle is in the hearing. If that were the case, though, here's a couple of problems with it. Then to whom is the primary spiritual gift of tongues given? To believers or to non-believers? In fact, the gift of interpretation of tongues would be given here to non-believers, not to believers. So both of these do not seem consistent with the gifts of the Spirit which are given to believers. I personally believe that the believers here were given the ability, beyond their finite ability, to speak languages that were not their own. Xenolalia, right? Verse 9, nine we, we have this list. There's 15 nations listed here. Uh, and then verse uh, 11, both Jews and converts to Juda Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, our own glossa. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Those Christians are drinking again, right? That's what they're saying. So let's address this question. What is the purpose of tongues? Well, we can let God tell us because he says it right in verse 11, one of them, one of the purposes. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. The wonders of God. That's one of the purposes of tongues. See, Peter is not preaching here. Some think, well, this is about preaching to lost people through tongues. N no. If you carefully read, Peter is going to unpack what just happened, and he's going to explain the gospel in a moment in presumably a language they understood, but they probably all understood Hebrew because they were God-fearing Jews from all over the world. Okay? But what, is, what are the wonders of God? The magnificence is another translation. The splendor or splendidness of God. Do you know what tongues are about? They're about God is so great a being, he wants us to know him. And he'll even dream up <laughs> this strange way of us getting to know him. Like to us it's strange, but it's really unimaginably strange to us. But to God it's not, and that is tongues. Another language to get our attention. Why? Because he wants us to know him. He wants us to get close to him and understand him and how great he is. In fact, Peter goes on to explain what just happened. Look at verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the 11, the other 11 uh, apostles, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain. Remember, edification requires intelligibility. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. And this is one of the most humorous verses of scripture in the Bible. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. <laughs> What's he saying? Everyone knows that people don't get drunk until at least 4 p.m. Like, what is he saying here? We're not sure. But they won't be drinking this early in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, and we looked at that 
uh, another time that the last days began at, at the resurrection of Christ and continue until the return of Christ. And so we are in the last days now, as were they. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. All of these are supernatural, revelatory gifts. Okay, verse 18, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. So what is the purpose of tongues? To declare the wonders of God. Secondly, to signify that the Holy Spirit has been poured out into his people, the church. The Holy Spirit is not just vis visiting this prophet or this king or this, this judge in the Old Testament, right? Now, He's coming into every believer in Jesus. And it can manifest in supernatural ways like tongue speaking. I know I told this story here before, but some of you have not heard it, and so I'm going to tell it again of a friend, dear friend of Karen's and mine named Alan. And he and his wife were missionaries in Cuba. And he's walking in the high mountains one day in Cuba with another Spanish brother, and they were going to a village to, to go and share the gospel of Jesus. And a Portuguese man came along, and they, and they say hello, and they see that he can't speak Spanish, and they can't speak Portuguese, when all of a sudden, Alan, or Arnold, Arnold, it was Arnold, Arnold's friend starts speaking Portuguese and communing with this guy, and then sharing the gospel, apparently, with this guy, and the fellow received the Lord Jesus as his savior there on the spot, and they went on their way. And Arnold turns to his friend and says, when did you learn Portuguese? And he said, right as I began speaking to that guy. I have never learned a word of Portuguese in my life. But he was given the gift, xenolalia, of Portuguese. And Arnold was there, and he saw it, and he knows that it happened. And that story repeats itself many times on the mission field and no doubt in North America as well. I've just not known anyone that that's happened to. I've asked for that to happen to me if I ever have an encounter like that. Next week, I'm going to tell you a story of what I call emergency tongues <laughs> that got some Christians out of big trouble because they got tongues in a moment, but I'll tell that next time. There are three chapters in Acts where tongues are spoken. Acts 2, Acts 10, and Acts 19. Very quickly, here it is in, verse, in, in Acts 10. Now, I need to set this up. This is a story where Peter has a vision while he's, in a, he's sleeping or in a trance. He has a vision of a sheet let down from heaven with unclean animals, and he's told to kill and eat. And he says, wait a minute, I've never eaten an unclean animal. Yeah, but I'm sending you to the Gentiles. Don't call anything unclean that I've called clean. And so he gets called to Cornelius' house, who's a Roman soldier, right? Here it is. While Peter was still speaking these words, and we know what he was speaking, he was sharing the gospel of Jesus. He was telling them the gospel story. And when he was still doing that, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished, so the Jewish believers were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God declaring the wonders, the greatness of God. Isn't that interesting? They're given tongues to speak the greatness of God. Now, is this xenolalia or glossolalia? We don't know for sure. This context doesn't really tell us. Now, Peter's obviously speaking in the language they understand, but we don't know what these tongues are. Let's go to Acts 19. This is the, the third and last time in Acts that we see it. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. So not a Jewish city, a Gentile city. Then he found some disciples. Now we see the word disciples and we automatically think disciples of Jesus, but we're going to find out they aren't. They found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked then, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. 
He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So this is an interesting story, right? These are disciples of John. They have been baptized into a baptism of repentance. What does that mean? That means I don't want to sin anymore. I repent. I don't want to sin anymore. But that's as far as they went. They had not then believed in the one who forgives our sins, past, present, and future. And so that's what Peter or sorry, Paul points them to, and they receive it immediately, and they receive the Holy Spirit immediately. And here, there's evidence of that through tongues. Now, is this xenolalia or glossolalia? Again, we don't know. There is no clear uh, definition through this context. But I do want to ask you the question. Have you repented of your sins? Have you said, I don't want to sin anymore? I really am sick of my sin. I want to turn my back on it. But the power then is in turning to Jesus and receiving him as your Savior and your Lord. And then he can set us free. Have you received him into your life as Savior and King? So very quickly, and I close, what is the purpose of tongues? To declare the wonders of God, to show the Holy Spirit has been poured out on his church, um, next time we're going to look at three more purposes, but here they are, to build oneself up, to build up oneself, to build up the church community, to pray, to sing, and to praise God personally. Okay, so we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 14. Feel free to read ahead, study ahead, all you like. <laughs> that would be good. And we're going to try and decide, is this xenolalia or glossolalia? in 1 Corinthians 14. And I'm, oh, I'm also going to demonstrate speaking in tongues next week. So you don't want to miss that. My wife is already crawling under a chair <laughs> with secondhand embarrassment. But come on out next week. Oh, and here's the other thing. Please send your questions. Next week really will be kind of a, a Q&R about tongues. So if you have any questions, the next three days until Tuesday night, okay? After Tuesday night, I can't promise because that's, yeah, study needs to be done by Wednesday. So, so if you could, that would be great. But we are going to close and lead into communion talking about Charles Wesley. And this is very much connected to our topic. Charles Wesley was an incredible writer of songs and poems. Over 6,500 songs and poems. We sang one last week, and can it be? We sang one this week, over a thousand tongues. Well, the beautiful thing about this song, uh, over a thousand tongues, it was his one year anniversary song. One year anniversary of what? Well, let me tell you a story really quickly. He was born in Epworth, England in 1707. He was ordained as a minister in the Anglican Church in 1735 at the age of 28. He then received Jesus and became a born-again believer in 1738 at the age of 31. You say, wait a minute. A minister? Got saved? Yes, that's what happened. Both he and his brother John, similar experience. Both missionaries but both very religious, and they did not know Jesus. That is entirely possible. To be in church, to even become an ordained minister, and not actually know Jesus personally as Lord and Savior. Well, a year after he received Jesus, he then wrote, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, as an anniversary song. Isn't that beautiful? In 1739. Um, so, so what happened? Well, in 1738, Charles was extremely sick. He had pleurisy. In fact, it looked like he was going to die. And he had been studying under a missionary and scholar named Peter Bowler, and Peter was at Charles' bedside. And he asked him the question, Charles, if you die, do you hope to be saved? 
And Charles said, yes. And Peter said, on what are you basing your hope? And Charles said, I have done everything I could to serve God to the very best of my ability. And Peter just simply looked at him and said, that won't make you right with God. And in that moment, through those simple words, Charles was deeply convicted that he was not right with God. And then Peter went on to say, it is only by grace alone that you or I can be saved. Only by putting our faith 100% in the work of Christ. Not showing God all of our works and saying, please love me, please accept me. No, just come to him and have faith that he already does love you and he already does accept you and he'll forgive you through the work of Jesus alone. And on that deathbed, Charles simply received Jesus into his life and became born anew, born again. And he survived and he got well and on the anniversary in May of 1739, he wrote 18 verses. Thank you, Jackie, that we only sang five today. But 18 <laughs> verses. And verse seven is our verse one. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Now, this is really interesting. Jackie shared what I had shared with her, that some commentators believe that Charles was saying, oh, for a thousand languages to sing my great Redeemer's praise. And others say, no, 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 that, that, that's not what he meant. What he meant was, apparently Peter Bowler had said to him, had I a thousand tongues, I would praise God with them all. And so that's what he borrowed. And I read both of those and said, I think we're gonna have to ask Charles when we see him <laughs> to figure out what he actually meant, because we don't know. Either one works, doesn't it? Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King. The triumphs, the triumphs of his grace. He knew the triumph of God's grace in his life. So beautiful. And then verse 2 is like, here's the missionary heart of Charles. My gracious master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. He wanted to spread the honors of Jesus throughout the world, but he knew he needed the assistance of God, and so do you and I. We cannot do this unempowered by the Spirit. Jesus, it's an exclamation. The name that charms our fears. Oh, it's so interesting. Some hymn books have changed the word charms to calms our fears because charm sounds spooky. <laughs> well, it does. It's, it's almost magical the way God charms our fears. We bring him our fears and our sorrows and he powerfully calms our hearts that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music. It's a melody in the sinner's ears. Tis life and health, and peace. This is rich. Do you know him this way? Do you know Jesus this way? Is he music to your ears? That's what he wants to be. He wants to be your life, and your health, and your peace. Oh, this song. This stanza grips my heart every time. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. This is, this is really Charles' testimony, isn't it? His blood is availed for me. I'm not only forgiven, I've been set free. That's what God wants to do. This is a testimony right here. He breaks the power of canceled sin. And then, believe it or not, this last line is actually Charles' first stanza. So in the poem, the song he wrote, this is the first line. To God all glory, praise, and love be now and ever given by saints below and saints above, the church and earth and heaven. Wow, does he have a very large, very wide picture of believers in God, in Jesus, below and above, all together bringing glory to God. It's a powerful song powerful song. 
And so as we have communion, we're going to hear that song playing again. And may that Savior that Charles found all those years ago, may he be the one that you delight in today. Because that God delights in you and wants you to know just how wonderful he is and how wonderful he can be in your life. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. 1 Corinthians 10, or sorry, verse, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 says this, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed. He took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It goes on to say, so then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So if you have not received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, please just feel free to sit where you are and just observe. Um, you don't want to be eating and drinking this judgment that it talks about. But if you know him personally and you know what this is about, then please come and partake. Let's pray. Let's pray. God, we may not feel the enthusiasm in this moment, maybe some do, but the enthusiasm that Charles felt when he said, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. God, we have one tongue, and we want to use it now to praise you, Jesus, and to thank you for all that you've done in providing salvation personally for each one of us. And so we take these emblems to remember you to the Father and say, this is the sacrifice that you've accepted on my behalf, and I'm free. And we worship you because of it, and we praise your name. Lord, may we use our tongue all the days of our life, whether it's in our known language or some other language that we learn or do not ever know, but we speak it. May it all be about praising our great God. In Jesus' name.